a lot of these you know, areas we're going to cover are misunderstood or not fully understood. And I think in general, people don't fully understand how important hormones are in our overall health. So maybe we can start there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, essentially, hormones control an awful lot of our lives without us even realizing it. Um, they're essentially chemical messengers, and they're usually made by glands. Uh, they are there's over 50 different hormones in the body, which a lot of people don't realize. And so uh, traditionally, people tend to know that our testes make testosterone and ovaries make estrogen. We've got our thyroid, we've got our adrenal glands, we've got the pancreas, which obviously is a is an endocrine organ, a hormone organ, but even the skin can actually make hormones. Things like vitamin D and even things like testosterone can be um, enhanced or at least stimulated by things like sunlight production. And all these things work together in an amazing synergy, in a feedback loop. And I find that really fascinating um, because it controls our growth, our metabolism, puberty, uh, appetite, fertility, menopause, uh, sperm counts, uh, you name it, it's got something to do um, in the body. So yeah, I think hormones are really important. And I like to think of it actually as a bit like an orchestra, is uh, how I just sort of started to describe it in my book. You know, everything works perfectly. Um, then you've got a beautiful symphony. But as soon as the conductor is off or the bassist is having a bad day or the violin's a bit screechy, then it turns into a cacophony of noise. So that's what can happen sometimes if you've got too much of one hormone, which can then lead to too little of another. And then you you kind of fall into this cascade um, of... A situation where a lot of other things are becoming imbalanced in the body without us quite knowing where to start. So yeah, it's a big topic, but as an as a broad overview, it is quite complicated. But if we can do a few of the basic things right, then um, we're going to hopefully be able to help our hormones uh, to work in harmony. Absolutely, and I think something that came through really clearly in your book and in your work is how. Yes, there are. There's a lot of hormones. There's a lot going on. If, if one is off, it can cause a big problem. But when you do a lot of really smart, basic lifestyle habits, like you don't have to overthink it. Like the body can sort this out on its own and 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 really have that symphony working when you're doing the a certain key things yourself. You don't have to like micromanage fifty different hormones. Is what no. I'm trying to say. No, no, yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to think about it at all. You, this is all subconscious. <laughs> it's controlled you know, by the hypothalamus, by the pituitary gland, by all the other um, endocrine organs in your body. They do their thing, and they can work really well in harmony. Uh, but we can help them out by also doing some of the simple, basic things. So we don't have to worry too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there are a couple, you know, main conditions that I think are most important to focus on. So. Why don't we start there with the main conditions that uh, we should really pay attention to when it comes to hormones? Yeah, I mean, I think probably for those of you guys listening, the most obvious thing that most people think of when they think about hormones is um, the monthly cycle. Like those who are born with a womb, women tend to have a monthly cycle in their reproductive years from you know anywhere between the ages of sort of 10 up to 50, um, roughly. And that is probably the most hormonally regulated thing that most people think of. So if I start briefly with that and explain how some of the things that we can do to improve that, um, then that might be a, a good place yeah, to start. It's a from. great place to start. So just so you've got a basic understanding, what tends to happen are our estrogen levels tend to be lowest just before and during a period. And then as the ovaries are releasing estrogen, um, then gradually up to a peak about two weeks later, that's what then stimulates ovulation. If the egg is then unfertilized, the um, estrogen levels dip slightly and then they gradually rise to help the um, thicken the endometrial lining to allow for um, the egg to, to, to implant. Um, but if the egg is not fertilized, as I mentioned, the, the estrogen levels fall very rapidly and then the womb lining is shed. And that's what happens every month as part of the monthly cycle. When that womb lining um, comes out, then a couple of things happen. You've got prostaglandins released by the cells within the womb lining and they 
basically contract the womb and they're responsible for the pain. So women get period pains. That's that's what happens. And when those prostaglandins go into the bloodstream, that can then cause other problems like nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and so you've got this situation where if you're overexposed to estrogen, what tends to happen is you get too much of the womb lining uh, building up. And if you're overexposed to prostaglandins, then you've got too much in the way of contraction and pain as that womb lining sheds. So what we can do to improve period pains um, is reduce our excess estrogen exposure and reduce our excess prostaglandin exposure. And how can we do that? Well, a few ways. Um, Interestingly, actually, there is a role for, for medications in this, which, which might help people understand why they work. So the oral contraceptive pill works by inhibiting um, and the estrogen, the natural estrogen, so your womb lining doesn't build up as much. And anti-inflammatory painkillers work by inhibiting prostaglandins. That's why they're so useful at reducing period pain. But in terms of diet, there's, there's a few things we can do. So we can reduce our excess prostaglandin exposure by limiting our um, exposure to things like meat and dairy and excess processed oils, because they will naturally um, stimulate prostaglandins in us. But also in terms of estrogen, if we are carrying excess weight or if we're suffering from constipation or if we have a lot of plastics exposures that we're not aware of, these are all things that can actually potentially increase our exposure to unwanted estrogen. So um, we can lose weight if, if, if it's possible to lose some excess weight, um, assuming that we have weight to lose. Uh, if, we, if we're suffering from constipation, we can think, OK, let's try and get that sorted. Let's increase our fibre. Let's increase our fluids. Because when you're constipated, what happens is you're overexposed to estrogen because it's not just food waste that you're coming that's coming out through um, your gastrointestinal system, but your body is also getting rid of excess unwanted hormones and other factors. And so when you're constipated, you reabsorb those through the gut lining and that can therefore increase your unwanted estrogen exposure. So making sure you go regularly is a really good one. Um, and lastly, plastics. This is something people don't tend to touch on very much, actually, but it's really important because there's a lot of type constituents in plastics that have hormone mimicking effects. Uh, we know a lot about research around phthalates, which are substances in plastic that help the durability and the flexibility of plastics. And they have been shown to have hormone mimicking effects and potentially expose us to excess estrogen. So they can potentially affect things like development, um, even obesity, for example, fertility, even the proliferation and invasiveness of certain cancers, sperm counts, um, and even, you know, some studies have shown that missing testicles at birth and something called hyperspadias in boys, which is where the, um, the wee tube, the urethra, grows um, slightly below the base of the tip of the penis. All these things could potentially uh, be associated with uh, phthalate exposure and other uh, types of plastics as well have been implicated. So those are things that it's really great to be aware of so that we can start to shift certain things in our lifestyle to enable us to hopefully have a better hormonal balance. It's amazing how often the environmental concerns or, or health concerns around plastics have been coming up um, for a lot of uh, conditions these days. But also I think it's interesting how what you're talking about here is you know, you, you're limiting the meat consumption because of the composition of meat but also, in this case, you know, meat, because of the lack of fiber, could lead to con uh, constipation. So it's kind of like a cascade effect of sort of making you know, an unhealthy choice versus making a much more uh, healthy choice. So that's really, really important to note. 